My name is Robert Fox, and um, I want to take a rather parochial view of Thomas Harriot's history, and that is to look about his look at his origins, his student days in Oxford. Now, I have to move on. I think yes, there we are. Uh, it begins, or my story begins, in 1990 when David Quinn came to Oxford, to Oriel College, to give a lecture. Quinn was the supreme British historian of colonial America, and his lecture was on Harriet. It was called Thomas Harriet and the Problem of America. Well, we thought at the time it would be a one-off event, but 32 years on, what's now an annual Thomas Harriet lecture, uh, is still going strong, and in November, Larry Tice was with us in Oxford uh, lecturing on the coloured images in the Theodore de Brie 1590 editions of the famous Brief and True Report of the Newfoundland of Virginia. Over the 32 years, most of the, of the lectures, most of the lectures have been published and there is a third volume of lectures now, including Larry Tice's lecture, uh, in press with Routledge. So the question is, why all this activity in Oxford? Why in Oriel in particular? Well, uh, Harriet was certainly a local boy. He was from Oxford or from nearby, uh, and he was an Oxford graduate. And the university, this is the university's matriculation register, and it shows him entering in December 1577. He's <coughs> described as Oxoniensis, coming from Oxford. He was 17 years old. And we know that he graduated BA, Bachelor of Arts, in 1580. <coughs> we also know that he was at Oriel, or more or less at Oriel. It's not absolutely obvious, because actually he was at a small community, a small community called St. Mary Hall, um, and on the map of Oxford at the time, you can see this is St. Mary Hall, where Harriet was, and this is the rather more spacious grounds of Oriel College. So St. Mary Hall was adjacent to Oriel College and was eventually assimilated into Oriel College much, much later in 1902. The image on the right is St. Mary Hall as it probably looked in Harriet's time, apart from the rather tall building at the back on the left, which was built right at the end of his life, and it's, he would never have seen it. Uh, anyway, Oriel claims Harriet as a distinguished alumnus, and for some years it's had what we like to regard as the portrait of, of uh, Harriet in the college dining hall. Uh, the portrait's obviously one that you, many of you will be familiar with. In fact, this is a copy. It's a modern copy done by a, a portrait painter, Dickon Swan. It was copied about 15 years ago from the original portrait, also in Oxford, in Trinity College. And the sitter, uh, like, the port, like the painter, is unidentified. But uh, in Oriel, we've persuaded ourselves that this is Harriet. The date, 1602, on the portrait, that's about right. Uh, you've got the, the dignified demeanor, I think the, the clothing, they fit nicely enough. It was always said that Harriet dressed rather austerely in black. But of course the question remains, is it really him? Well, the words on the top left-hand corner, uh, just enlarged there, the words on the top left-hand corner would suggest probably not. Aetatis Suai, age 32 of this uh, sitter, this subject. So this person, assuming the date of 1602 is correct, this person was born in 1570, but we know Harriet was born 10 years before that. So perhaps not Harriet, false alarm. But there is then a bit of mystery. Until the original portrait, the one in T Trinity College in Oxford, was cleaned, restored 60 years ago, that 32 had actually read 42, which would, of course, coincide perfectly with the birth date of 1560, Harriet's birth date. But that same restoration, 60 years ago, 
also showed that the 42 had been added later. It had been painted over the original 32. So what we see now, after in the restoration, the 42 was obliterated because it was an addition, so it was removed. So what we have now, uh, at least in the copy, is the portrait with the 42 removed, is the portrait as it was originally painted. So why on earth did anybody scratch out 42 and, and substitute 32? Well, perhaps some, or, or write 42 over the original 32. Perhaps some contemporary knew that this was Thomas Harriet. Perhaps the artist had painted 32 in error, so that 42 was a correction. Uh, perhaps an early correction, or, or was it perhaps uh, some idea that, of much later that the sitter might be Harriet, and that to clinch the case, 42 fitted better than 32, so a forgery or a fake, if you'd like. Well, uh, for myself, and I think it's true of colleagues in, in the college as well, we just want to believe it's Harriet. It's, a, it's an act of faith. Um, anyway, Whoever the sitter is, Oriel is very proud of its association with Harriet. And I want to add here, proud of its association <coughs> with the Thomas Harriet College of Arts and Sciences in the, at East Carolina University, the, known as the Thomas Harriet College, thanks to the indefatigable efforts of Keith Sparrow, who was dean of the college at that time. But of course, however proud Oriel may be of Harriet, it leaves the open question of what Harriet got out of Oxford. And I'd want to argue, make a very simple point, quite a lot. Not so much, I think, because of the syllabus itself. Uh, that was still quite rooted in the medieval trivium. That's the trio of traditional undergraduate disciplines, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. So grammar, knowing language, rhetoric, knowing ways of speaking and writing, and logic, knowing how to reason, how to distinguish the true from the false. Well, you know, it's, it's not a bad basis for education, but it wasn't the basis that for me, would have made the great figure of the English Renaissance that Harriet became. The action in Harriet's Oxford, I think, was unfolding beyond the syllabus. In fact, there was a real buzz about mid-16th century Oxford, especially through, and I'd say especially through the 1560s and 70s, and especially for students like Harriet, uh, the plebeian students. I mean, just remember the matriculation uh, register again. Harriet's identified as the son of a plebeian, that doesn't mean that he was necessarily poor or disadvantaged, it's just that he wasn't a gentleman. Now, by Harriet's time, about half of Oxford students would have been plebeians. They were growing in number, and they were beginning, I think, in important ways to transform the university, to transform it socially and intellectually. And they tended to be serious students. They, most of them were looking for careers as priests in the new Protestant Church of England or as schoolmasters in the, the grammar schools, the grammar schools that were blossoming uh, up and down the country, all of them requiring graduates of the university. Most important, I think, for our understanding of Harriet is that these new students were receptive to the tide of Renaissance humanism that was beginning to circulate in Oxford. Uh, and I think that tide of humanism had its long-term consequences for Harriet. I mean, if you look at logic, for example, what he'd have learned was certainly more up-to-date mathematics than he would have learned even 10, 20 years earlier. He might have been exposed to some of the new ideas in astronomy, perhaps the first questioning of Aristotle's idea of an Earth-centered universe. Uh, under grammar, he'd certainly have learned a new and more sophisticated Latin. And on this, incidentally, it's curious, though I think significant, that Harriet wrote his wonderful commentary on the plates of the, the, on the John White drawings uh, in the 1590 debris editions of the Brief and True Report, not in English, but in Latin. 
that then had to be translated into English, into French, and into German for the various debris editions of the book. And it was Latin that Charles Fantasi, uh, professor of Neo-Latin at East Carolina University, has described as fluent, elegant, humanistic. It was admirable Latin, imaginative Latin that coped, I think, creatively with the new words that were needed to convey the colonists' experience of the new world. So it's a long way from the crabbed, rather mechanical Latin of the Middle Ages. Also on the grammar front, uh, Harriet was probably one of the first English scholars to have a serious command of Greek. So what you can see, I think, is a new world that's opening up. Um, England was awakening, I think rather late in the day, but it was awakening to the European Renaissance, and Harriet was very much part of that. But more importantly for Harriet, um, more importantly for Harriet, I think, was that Oxford offered contacts. Uh, contact, for example, in mathematics with Thomas Allen. Now, this was um, a very prominent creative or, or knowledgeable perhaps more than creative mathematician, but he happened to be a Catholic. And this in Protestant Oxford meant that he was effectively excluded from the mainstream of university life. He had to leave his college, which was Trinity College, and move to a smaller community known as Gloucester Hall. Um, but he was nevertheless a presence around Oxford, though not officially involved in teaching or in any of the university's formal exercises. Harriet almost certainly would have met Thomas Allen, and through Allen would have learned about continental mathematics. Allen, I mean, largely through being a Catholic, was in much closer contact with France and the continental tradition, and I think uh, Harriet would have gained enormously from the contact with, with Alan, as it almost certainly happened. Uh, but of course, the uh, contact I'd love to mention here, with regard especially to the problem of America, would have been with Walter Raleigh. Now, we know that Raleigh had been an undergraduate at Oriel. He was a gentleman commoner, so not a plebeian, but just four or five years before Harriet arrived at St. Mary Hall. And it would have made for, a, a, I mean, a lecturer's dream story to be able to say that Harriet had met Raleigh in Oxford because Oriel's just over the wall from St. Mary Hall and so on. You could have elaborated that. But unfortunately, we can be pretty sure that's not how it happened. A more substantial contact, though, was... This is Raleigh, and we do, I might say that Oriel does lay claim to Raleigh as well, and has a big portrait of Raleigh in the, in the dining hall. But a more important contact would have been, with, for Harriet, would have been with, uh, Tom, with Richard Hacklett. Now, Hacklett was an established figure in the university, somewhat older than Harriet, but not enormously, began giving public lectures on geography in Oxford in the year Harriet entered as an undergraduate. Geography wasn't part of the syllabus, but in what was becoming increasingly common practice around the universities, lectures, his lectures, were just open to anybody who wanted to come along. And it's hard to imagine that Harriet wasn't among those who went along to hear Hacklett. And his, Harriet's subsequent writing about America, to me, bears an unmistakable Hacklett thumbprint. Now, what Harriet would have learned from Hacklett, what Har Harriet would have learned from Hacklett was a full-on advocacy of the vo of voyages of discovery in general and of the colonization of America in particular. Hacklett had a hand in virtually every English colonial venture between the 1580s until his death in 1616. And he was spectacularly well-connected, well-known in court diplomatic circles. He had what Peter Mankell of University of South Carolina has called an obsession with an English America. And it's not hard to imagine, it's not to, uh, that Hacklett used his lectures to convey this obsession. Even though Hacklett never went to the New World, 
Uh, as a geographer, he knew the literature, he knew the travelers' tales about America, he'd read the accounts of natural resources, the gold, the silver, copper, and so on. And as a clergyman, I mean, this is the, the Reverend Richard Hacklett, he saw the potential for the conversion of the inhabitants. And once conversion was complete, the economic potential of a biddable, subservient wake workforce able to exploit the colonized land. As well as the Feast of Opportunities, Hacklett knew, was well aware of the challenges. How were the colonists to settle in this strange land when they didn't speak the language? How, how would they even get there? How would they navigate their way through this uh, treacherous coast, to this treacherous coast? How would the, the captains, how would the military men who made up the bulk of those on the expedition, how would they be trained? How would they learn the seafaring skills that were needed? If Harriet heard all this in Hacklett's lectures, and we can be pretty sure that he did, it would have been heady stuff. I mean, here he is, he's a 20-year-old. For someone who was, in David's Quinn, uh, David Quinn's uh, description, a supreme problem solver, the challenge would have been irresistible. And I think if Harriet needed any further encouragement to engage with the problem of America, he had only to read those accounts, the accounts of the, the conquests of the Aztecs and the uh, Incas just a few decades before. Those accounts, of course, were self-serving. They were written to please. They were written to win favor with the crown far away back at the Spanish court. So next to nothing was said about the mistakes, the missteps, uh, or the local resistance. And nothing at all, of course, was said about the experiences of the indigenous peoples whose lands were being colonized. Now, you realize, I think, and this is a point I want to make, just how misleading this preparation, Harriet's preparation, could be. In his Thomas Harriet lecture in 2019, Felipe Fernandez Armesto of Nova, Notre Dame University urged us to turn the tables and, and view the colonizing process much more through other eyes. In other words, the eyes of the colonized. To realize, for example, that those people who we perhaps too easily regard as in undifferentiated victims of colonization could have an agenda, could have an agency of their own. And that deference, let me just take that deference to strangers that Harriet commented on, that the Spanish conquistadors often interpreted as their being received as gods. Uh, that deference could be a matter of self-interest. Potent powerful invaders could be used. They could make useful allies in conflicts with neighbors. So deference, if you like, could in certain circumstances, not all certainly, but deference could make strategic sense. And deference was always, as Harriet was to learn, was always conditional. Anyway, once here, once in America, Harriet soon saw that empire building in practice was anything but easy, anything but straightforward, and the indigenous peoples that he encounters were anything but lesser. And I think you can see that coming out in the parallel registers that run through the brief and true report. One register was the encouraging, optimistic report that Harriet had been commissioned to write, and he did it honorably and fully, of course, for Raleigh. The other register comes across in an undertow, I think, an undertow of what I think we can only read as Harriet's personal unease with the venture. Uh, it doesn't crop up frequently, but it does, it does appear. For example, in the Brief and True Report, he talks about how some of our company towards the end of the year were too fierce in slaying some of the people um, about, this is about petty misdemeanors that, you know, could have been punished and dealt with in much lighter ways. Um, and I think the result was, you can see this, these uh, doubts that Harriet has, almost perhaps even an element of guilt. Uh, and you can see that, I think, 
coming up in, in the book uh, from time to time, and it resulted in a sort of tension uh, between two loyalties. He had a loyalty, a real loyalty, to the project, to the appointed governor, Ralph Lane, but he also had a loyalty to the Algonquin Indians who so fascinated him. Of course, the Indians had initial response to the settlers, uh, huge ships, the, the guns, the uh, unfamiliar devices, that had been childlike. But that for Harriet, and he insisted, insisted on that, that for Harriet would pass, leaving a people who had their place quite as much as Europeans in God's grand design. They were not a people to be killed, subjugated, expelled from the land in the traditional manner of colonizing ventures. They were not to be valued simply uh, for the benefits they could bring to the colonizers, as Hacklett had taught uh, back in, in Oxford in those lectures. What Harriet saw was something rather different, something for which Harriet's, uh, Hacklett's lectures had, and his own reading for that matter, uh, had not prepared him. What he saw was a settled society, codified social structure, a simple legal system, hierarchy of gods headed by a single god. There was even some notion of an afterlife. And for Harriet, Algonquin religion had all the character, I think, of a pristine faith, perhaps the faith of a pre-lapsarian world. And it was a world and I'm thinking back again to his Oxford experiences, his upbringing. It was a world free from the confessional tensions that he had known and witnessed in Elizabethan England. So where, to conclude, are we now with Harriet? Where do we go with Harriet? Well, in her recent very fine biography, Robin Arianrod has described how Harriet, over the years for which she was writing her book, and it took many years, how Harriet had got under her skin. She'd got to know him, and I think that's true of the wider community of Harrieteers as well. In ways that would have been far more difficult a generation ago, we're all getting to know him through the excavations conducted here uh, on Roanoke, those new excavations of which we, we heard some details yesterday on the, on the tour of the site. Through those 8,000 sheets of manuscripts currently being digitized in a major project centered at University of Notre Dame, Max Planck Institute in Berlin and, and in Oxford. Um, through the annual Thomas Harriet seminar that Stephen Klukas has led for many years in London and Durham, and always through uh, the understanding, our improved in understanding of the images, those images, the images of, of uh, John White, studied by Kim Sloan, and the images they reproduced uh, as engravings uh, in the 1590 debris editions of the True and Ro True, Brief and True Report, studied by Larry Tice in this book which is on display at the back on the table. And through all these efforts, it seems to me we're coming to a Harriet more deeply nuanced, more textured, uh, more rooted in his time and context. Now, I wanted to argue, just to make the simple point, that Elizabethan England, Elizabethan Oxford in particular, has a place in that context, in that wider context. I don't want to make exaggerated claims uh, for the importance of his Oxford experience. After all, he was only 20 when he graduated, and unusually for the time, he had 40 years of life ahead of him. I think his eyes were certainly opened to many things in Oxford, but the shocks of life, the shocks of real life, they lay ahead of him. The shock of America, first and foremost. The shock of uh, that first observation with the telescope when he was able to see the moons of Jupiter in orbit around Jupiter, which was absolutely incompatible with the Aristotelian universe. The shock, I think, of uncomfortable closeness to his second patron, um, Henry Percy, and through Percy to the gunpowder plot, um, the plot to blow up the 
King of England, and the shock of Raleigh's declining fortunes. After all, he was a good patron and a good friend, culminating in the execution of Raleigh in 1618. So much still to do, plenty still to do, plenty to discover, to study, uh, to rethink. Though in the knowledge, uh, again in the words of Robin Arianrod, that we can never hope to present the definitive Harriet. He was too big, he was too multifaceted, I think, for that. So he'll always remain, as she insists, he will always remain a mystery. And all we can do is for each of us to bring together our own Harriet, put together our Harriets, if you like, our various Harriets, as you've allowed us to do in this wonderful symposium. So to you all, to, of course to Labam in particular, who I, I know has been an inspiration for this uh, initiative, but to all of you, we're all in your debt, and uh, I want to, for myself, certainly, at least certainly, to thank you most warmly for this occasion, this opportunity of being here with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>